This is our fifth annual Wally and Lutz Hammerschlag Summer Educator Workshop Seminar. Thank you. And for this workshop, we've break, broken our international record of participants because this summer we have represented Australia, New Zealand, Greece, Italy, Spain, Germany, Portugal, United Kingdom, Croatia, and for the first time, Argentina. Welcome all of you. And uh, we're thrilled to have you. And also we met our goal. We have a total of 78 teachers that are enrolled uh, in our workshop. All of our workshops and seminars are free. And the only thing that we ask of you please is at the end, there'll be an evaluation. That is very important for us, very important for future planning, very important for our um, donors and supporters. Please uh, complete our evaluation. Also, the uh, Holocaust survivor that you will meet today, Betty Grubinchikov, the author that you will meet today, Bob Holden, uh, Dr. Michael Hayes will be referring to a, something written by Wally Hamashlag having to do with Kristallnacht. All of that will be mailed to you. And no problem if you live over at what we call live overseas. Um, we will mail to everyone the resource materials from today. So um, thank you very much. I'm so pleased to introduce our first presenter, Dr. Stanley Stahl. Yeah, I gave, I, you earned a PhD with me today, isn't that wonderful? Okay. Um, Stanley is the um, executive director, and I just gave her a new title, I think it's vice president, of Jewish Foundation for the Righteous, which is based here in New Jersey, we're so proud. And we are, a Center of Excellence, the Sarah and Sam Schofer Holocaust Resource Center at Stockton University. And I didn't introduce myself, I just realized that. I'm Gail Rosenthal and I am the director of the Holocaust Center at Stockton University. You'll get to know all of us um, today. And so often when we teach about the Holocaust and other genocides, if our students, comment about it, they say, oh, it could be when the dinosaurs were. Nothing's happening today that really relates to what you're doing. And of course, we know that that's not true. And so many of our local teachers near Stockton that we service said, what happened during the Holocaust with Ukraine? Does it relate at all to what's happening today? And I get the home delivery of the New York Times and I open it up and there's an article about my friend Stanley Stoll and all the work that she's doing in Ukraine. And Stanley, I'm gonna turn it over to you. And let me just say one other um, fact is that the presentations are important, yes. But just as important as the presentations are your questions. So after Stanley's uh, presentation, we'll be posing some questions to her from you. And please put your questions in the chat to um, our Irvin Marino Rodriguez and he will pose the questions to Stanley. I hope I left, did I leave anything out Irvin? Are we okay, ready to roll? I just want to make a comment that um, if you used an incorrect physical mailing address during your registration, maybe you used your school mailing address, that could be changed. So please feel free to reach out to, to Gail or I with your correct physical mailing address. So we send the resource materials to the correct address. Thank you. Thank you. That was brilliant because oftentimes when we send resource materials to schools, the teachers don't get it. I don't know what it, that's about but we prefer to send to your home. So ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to introduce a longtime friend, Stanley Stahl. 
Thank you, Gail. Or thank you, Professor Rosenthal, AKA Gail. I would like to thank Stockton University for inviting the Jewish Foundation for the Righteous to participate in this important program. And to thank you to each of you who are taking time out of your summer vacation to learn about different aspects of the Holocaust. And, and I think it's really important. And, and I wanna thank you for giving up some part of the next three days to be with us. Today, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to spend a very, very few minutes providing a short overview of World War II and the relationship between Nazi Germany and the former Soviet Union. It was the Soviet Union then. I then will provide an overview of rescue. I will provide some information on the work of the Jewish Foundation for the Righteous, also known as the JFR. And then I'm going to introduce you to some wonderful men and women, Ukrainian rescuers. And as Professor Rosenthal said, the Holocaust might have ended in 1945, and many of you are studying the historiography of the Shoah, the Holocaust. We at the Jewish Foundation for the Righteous interact with rescuers almost on a daily basis. So I'm going to share my screen. And let's, can everybody see this? I'm going to. Yes. Okay. Today I'm going to talk about rescue in Ukraine. And I'm going to introduce you to men and women, non-Jews, who perhaps the lone lights in the darkness. We in the Jewish community have given them a name. I'm going to say it in Hebrew, then I will translate it into English. The Hasidei Ha'amot Ha'ulam, the righteous among the nations of the world. They were men and women who had both the courage to care and the courage to act. And I think that's very important. As we sit and we look at what's happening in Ukraine, or we, we look at um, incidents around the world and here in our country, you know, we go, this is terrible. This is terrible. You care. We care. But how many people take the next step and act? And I think that's what's important. So as I said, I'm going to give you a very, very, very brief history of Nazi Germany and its relationship to the Soviet Union, which at that time Ukraine was part of. The war has not started. We all know the war started on September 1, 1939. Hitler's motive was for Lebensraum, more living space for the Germans. And on August 19, 1939, Germany and the Soviet Union signed a non-aggression pact known as the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. And this is a Herb Locke political cartoon from 1939. And you see here the Russian bear, and you see Hitler as the wolf in bed together, and this is Poland. The war has not started, but Soviet Germany made a calculated decision to keep the Soviet Union at bay. And what the decision was, they were gonna form a non-aggression pact. And what you're gonna see happening is World War II begins on September 1, 1939. And according to the pact that was signed in August, the former Soviet Union then invaded Poland on September 17, 1939. And this, with the horizontal striping, that was the territory that was annexed by the Soviet Union on September 17, 1939. So we're going to fast forward now to 1941. So from 1939 to June of 1941, Nazi Germany was focusing in on the parts of Poland that it had conquered and Western Europe. Nazi Germany invaded Western Europe in May, invaded the Low Countries, the Netherlands, Belgium, Luxembourg, and France. These countries all fell, France being the last in June of 1940. So now we're going to look very briefly at the Eastern Front. This is a German officer 
there are some 50,000 Soviet POWs in this image. Germany invaded the Soviet Union in what was called Operation Barbarossa on June 22nd, 1941. And these are pictures of German officers receiving their charges for the day. And this is just destruction. It can almost be looked at destruction as we see it to, in today's Ukraine. Some things you need to know. The Germans were unprepared for the Russian topography and weather. It resulted in depleting the Wehrmacht. Now the Wehrmacht is all of Germany's military. It's not just the army. It encompasses, when people say the Wehrmacht, many people think it's just the army. It encompasses their military. And the Wehrmacht was depleted of valuable resources that cannot be replaced. And it was a turning point of the war. When the Wehrmacht went in to the Soviet Union, they were followed by Einsatzgruppen who were mobile killing squads. And these Einsatzgruppen killed 1.3 million Jewish men, women, and children. The total number killed was about 1.5 million with the other 200,000 being non-Jewish Soviet citizens. Germany laid siege to Russian cities. So when we fast forward to today and you listen to the rhetoric that came out of Moscow in February of 2020 after the invasion, and then you understood what happened on May 9th when they celebrated, when Russia celebrated victory in Europe Day, German, Germany attempted to starve the Russian population. And you had three sieges that were, one was extremely long. The siege of Leningrad, today St. Petersburg, went from September of 1941 to January of 1944. I, I've been to St. Petersburg. I talked to people. I talked to Jewish Holocaust survivors. We have rescuers in St. Petersburg. And those were dire times. People were telling me that they ate cat, they ate dog. They dismantled their homes in order to get wood for, you know, in the winter for heat. Moscow siege went from September, the end of September 41 to April of 42, and Stalingrad went from August of 42 to February of 43. The Soviet citizens held out against the Germans. And let's take today's issues aside. We have much to be thankful to the Soviet Union for what they did during World War II, because it gave the United States the opportunity to be able to prepare for D-Day in June of 1944. So this is a very brief overview of what happened during World War II. First, they had a non-aggression pact. Things were fine until Germany invaded the Soviet Union. It was a brutal invasion. And you had what was called the Commissar Order. Initially, when Germany invaded, they, they, they went into Ukraine, they went into Belarus, Lithuania, they went as far as the gates of Moscow. They were to first kill the Commissars of the Communist Party. That order very quickly transcended into killing Jewish men, women, and children. So now we're going to look at rescue. During the Holocaust, thousands of non-Jews, mostly Christian and some Muslims, and that could be another lecture because Muslim Albania, which was ethnic Muslim, saved all of its Jews. And you also had Muslims living in what I know as the former Yugoslavia. These men and women, who I said earlier, had both the courage to care and the courage to act, risked their lives to save Jewish friends, neighbors, relatives, and strangers from certain death. So this is a picture of Nina Dorotken, Dorotkenkovskaya. And Nina and her mother lived in, as I know it, Kiev, now called Kiev. And they took in a Jewish physician who worked at a hospital, his name was Yaakov, who worked at a hospital in Kiev when Germany invaded Russia. In June of 41, he was conscripted into the Soviet army. He was captured. He managed to escape. He went back to Kiev. 
learned that his mother and his family had been murdered at Bobby Yar, Russian pronunciation, or Bobin Yar, Ukrainian pronunciation, and he realized he needed to go into hiding. He reached out to Nina's mother, um, and her mother was Natalia, and they agreed to hide him. And she had four children. Nina was one of them. And whenever there was a medical emergency in the community, Natalia and sometimes Nina would sneak out with Yaakov so he can tend to Ukrainian citizens that needed help, needed medical help. He was, he was denounced. The Germans actually, the Gestapo came to Natalia's apartment and they were unable to find his hiding place. And so they, they did not arrest Natalia and her children, nor did they find Jacob. And she hid him until Kiev was uh, liberated on November 6, 1943. So this is, this is one Ukrainian rescuer. She has passed on, but she's a very special lady. And the JFR provided funding for her until she passed away. So you look at the Jewish community in the former Soviet Union in Ukraine. And after Germany invaded the Soviet Union, Jews clung to the false hope that as bad as things were, they were not going to get worse. It is said they had the Jews had choiceless choices to leave their homes, to pass as an Aryan, a non-Jew, to go into hiding, to go further east. And many Jews tried to escape deep into the Soviet Union. You'll hear about Jews that went to Uzbekistan. You'll hear about Jews who wound up in Siberia. Going west was really not an option because Germany had conquered almost all of Europe, except for those few countries like Switzerland, Portugal, Spain, and Sweden that were neutral. So what you need to know, escape to the Christian world was a major undertaking for a Jewish person, even if they had someone to help them. So let us look and see who first would try to pass as a non-Jew as an Aryan, and you should never ever judge a book by its cover. Someone young, someone without family ties, someone who spoke Russian without a trace of Jewishness. Most of the Jews in Ukraine, while they may have spoken Russian or Ukrainian, most likely Russian, they spoke Yiddish. Yiddish was the primary language. Someone assimilated, and someone whose physical appearance conformed to the Slavic look. And remember, you never judge a book by its cover. But it was not easy for a Jewish person to try to pass as a non-Jew. You also had to know your prayers. If you were in Ukraine, you were either Catholic or Russian Orthodox, and you needed to be able to recite your prayers. You needed to go to church. Therefore, most Jews had to go into hiding as they could not pass as a Christian. The religious, and this is a picture taken from before the war of re religious Jews throwing, uh, strolling through a resort in the Tatra Mountains. The uneducated, those with limited incomes, laborers and tradesmen. So what you need to remember to go into hiding required the help of a non-Jewish person since most Jews were unable to pass as Christians. But what you also need to know is that the Germans employed the concept of collective responsibility. And this was, this was collective responsibility was, was paramount and enabled Germany to keep people who might've considered helping from helping. All Ukrainians, all Russians knew to help a Jew was to risk one's life and the lives of family members. If you were caught helping a Jewish person in Ukraine or elsewhere in Eastern Europe, you and your family would be killed. So if you lived on a farm with the, and you were hiding one Jewish person or 10, they would take the animals, the Germans would take the animals out of the barn they would put the entire Christian family in the barn along with the Jewish people they were hiding and they burned the barn down. Or they might hang you in front of your home on a meat hook. If you lived in a larger village or city, 
most towns had a, a village square and they would build gallows and they would hang, it was a public hanging, and then they would put a placard on the Christians that said, I help Jews. So collective responsibility, everyone knew, to ha everyone knew that if you helped a Jew, you would be killed. Now I need to make a statement here. If you lived in Western Europe and you were caught helping a Jewish person in any way whatsoever, you may not be killed. The, the punishments were different, but, but Nazi Germany had signs all over in the language of the country indicating what would happen if you helped a Jew in any way, whether it was providing food, whether it was giving shelter, whatever. And if you denounce someone, so let's say, I think that um, Barbara Daniel, who is on this call, or Leon Toddy, who is here from, Pitt, from Pennsylvania, were, were hiding Jews and I denounced them. And yes, they were hiding Jews. I probably got a kilo of sugar and a liter of vodka, maybe a pair of boots. Barbara Daniel, her family and the Jews, and Leon Toddy, her family and the Jews they were helping, they were all murdered. So collective responsibility, people knew what the punishment was if they helped a Jewish person. So it is important to remember to hide a Jewish person in Ukraine and Eastern Europe was truly a matter of life and death. I'm introducing you to a man named Vladimir Chernovil. He is this young man on the left and you'll see him later. But if a Jewish person survived the Holocaust and was not in a ghetto, a concentration camper with the partisans, that person received help from a non-Jew, whether it was food, papers, shelter, transportation, or the very act of not being denounced. Let me explain papers. You needed identity documents. If you were trying to pass as a Christian, you needed identity documents. You needed a Ken card. You needed ration coupons. You couldn't pass without forged papers. And you needed someone who could get you forged papers. More often than not, that person was non-Jewish. Shelter is, un you understand that. Transportation. Transportation could take one of several forms. You could be hiding, we have um, a woman in Brooklyn who is in Lviv or Lviv or Lemberg, all the same, just different pronunciations. And she was hiding with a family, Joanna Zawutska, and they were afraid that she was going to, they were going to be denounced by a neighbor. So they had to take this little Jewish girl who was about five at the time, her name was Ruth Gamzer, and they had to take her across Lviv to another family member. And so the very act of taking this little girl who did not have papers because she was in hiding across town and into another hiding place. Or there, for the most part, you did not have large ghettos in the former Soviet Union when the Germans came in because the Jews were killed by the mobile killing squads. But you did have ghettos in Vilna or Vilnius, Lithuania, in Kovno, in Kaunas, and you would be able to perhaps get smuggled out of the ghetto and to the home of a non-Jew who was willing to hide you. So transportation took uh, several forms. As insignificant as an act might seem, the absence of that act more often than not could be fatal. I will talk to you about Vladimir Chernobyl later. I met him in 1998 for the 50th anniversary of the State of Israel. At that time, Israel invited 50 rescuers representing men and women from the countries that they had recognized righteous Gentiles in. It is Yad Vashem, Israel's Holocaust Authority, that designates non-Jews as righteous among the nations, righteous Gentiles, or as we at the Jewish Foundation for the Righteous say, rescuers. I met Vladimir in 19, uh, 1998. He had a head of white hair and a lot of gold teeth. And I'll tell you his story as we get to the end of this presentation. There were a range of rescue activities, helping Jews escape to safety, hiding Jews, 
And when you were hiding a Jewish person, you needed to find a hiding place that couldn't be detected. And if you let somebody out of hiding, they had to be able to get back to it in seconds should someone come, whether it's a nosy neighbor, whether it's the Gestapo, whether it's the Kripo, which is the criminal police, helping Jews pass as non-Jews, teaching them Catholic or Russian Orthodox prayers, issuing protective papers, providing food, medicine, and other essentials, alerting about pending actions. And what you need to know is that rescue is both individual and collective. Today, I'm, I'm going to be talking about individual rescuers from Ukraine. And this is Antonina Kurdritskaya and Mosi, Moshe. And his mother had been killed. They were neighbors and they agreed to take the little boy in. Her mother, Antonina's mother, uh, Yelena, they lived in Kiev or Kiev, in Kiev or Kiev. And uh, the mother tried to pass as a Russian woman married to a Jew. It worked for a very short period of time. They were put, uh, they were then put in prison and the mother was killed and she was, they were able to prove, and I'm assuming that Moshe had not been circumcised, that he was Russian. And Jelena went and got 25 people in their building to sign affidavits that he was indeed a Russian Christian child. And then when the mother was killed by the Germans, Antonina and her family took him in and they, and they survived the war. So who were the rescuers? Rescuers came from all walks of life. There were peasants and laborers, middle-class and intellectuals, rich and poor, educated and illiterate, members of the clergy, nuns, priests, and ministers. Each had different motivations and limitations. And this is a picture of the Gonsher family. And what you need to know is biography is not destiny. And what do I mean by that? You would think, oh, these people, you had a family who was wealthy. They had a home. They had, you know, uh, they had money. They surely, and they were educated. They knew right from wrong. And surely they would be able to take in a Jewish child or a Jewish family. That was not necessarily the case. People who were poor, who were illiterate, who barely had enough food for their own family took in neighbors, friends, and strangers. And when you talk to rescuers who took in total strangers, they would say to you, what did this Jewish child, this two and a half year old, do to deserve to be killed? Or these are my neighbors, we've lived next to them for 30 years in peace. This makes no sense. Or they will say, I am a good Christian. I believe in the teachings of Christ. They will quote from the gospel. The rescuers were extraordinary people. They were ordinary people who did extraordinary deeds. And there were no typical rescuers. They were just people like us who said, not on my watch, and they chose to become involved. I think I have the best job in the world. Before COVID, I would go often to uh, mostly Eastern Europe, because that's where the rescuers that we support are. And, and I say, why did you do this? As I just said, they will say they did nothing special. Some had Jewish friends before the war, others did not. And some of the rescuers were known anti-Semites. What's important to note is that most rescuers who set out to help did so gradually. For in 1941, after the invasion of Ukraine and the former Soviet Union, no one knew how long the war would last. No one knew we're talking the end of the war, May 1945. Although when the Russian army counterattacked the Germans, parts of the Soviet Union were liberated before. And these are just pictures of, of rescuers. This is, this is interesting. And if I can pull up the email, I will, I will, I will try to post it later. This is um, Alphonse and Fedora Chaika. And I just received an email from his son. 
during the fighting in Ukraine, the Russian bombing, his monument, and if you've ever been to Poland or Ukraine or Lithuania and you've taken the time to go to a Christian cemetery, and I go to Christian cemeteries often because I will put flowers on the graves of rescuers who pass away. I also go to Jewish cemeteries, but I go to Christian cemeteries as well. And he had a, a monument because he, um, Alphonse, his parents are also recognized. And what you have in Eastern Europe to today, you have multiple generations living in the same home. So you have grandma and grandpa, his parents, Alphonse and his wife, and his children, his brothers and sisters, they all live together, multi-generational living. The monument was destroyed by Russian bombs. And he asked if we could help restore the monument. And probably this afternoon, I will be transferring $500 just approved by the JFR board to fix the monument as a tribute to the family who are righteous among the nations. Uh, this is Anna Berman and Peter Gutzel. This is Ivan Jacek, who died at the age of 101. And this is Natalia Bondarenko. And these are just very, very special men and women. When you speak to the rescuers, what, what you need to know is each act of rescue is different and each story is unique. The fact that it happened is important. You, you might read rescue stories and you go, oh, they hid, they did this, but there were close calls. There were neighbors, there were young children. And sometimes it's very hard to keep a two-year-old who is in hiding when a neighbor comes by or the Gestapo comes by or the German army is moving by silent. I think those of us who have children know this and it is very, it is very hard. So the fact that people stood up is what is important. So let us look at some facts and figures. This is from Yad Vashem, Israel's Holocaust Authority. This is updated as of January 1, 2021. That's the latest update. 27,921 men and women have been recognized, some 51 nationalities. And I've listed on the right the, the countries with the most number of men and women recognized. And you see Ukraine is listed after France with about 26. 173 men and women recognized as righteous among the nations. But this is not the actual number of Jews saved. We will never know the actual number. This is only based on testimony provided by Jewish survivors talking about the men and women who saved them. It's possible that someone survived the war in hiding and died in the early 50s or died in the late 40s. Yad Vashem was created by Israel's parliament, the Knesset, in 1953. There was a provision that Yad Vashem was to go and recognize non-Jews. It didn't happen until after the Eichmann trial, talking May of 1960. And so in the early 60s, Yad Vashem began searching and reaching out to find righteous Gentiles. So we will never know the true number. Also, Denmark. The Dana, Denmark saved all of its Jews, with the exception of very, very few, by taking them to Sweden. And that's a total, uh, that's another lecture. And the Danish resistance asked Yad Vashem that they recognize the Danish resistance en masse, which is what they did. So if you go on Yad Vashem's website, you will see very few individual names. The JFR funded a number of those men and women that are listed as individual rescuers that did their rescue outside. They were part of the resistance, but they were they were rest, they, they did their rescue outside of the resistance, if that makes any sense. An important point here is that rescuers were the precious few. There are no heroes without villains. And whatever the number, there were too few. But then there are too few moral heroes in history. Jewish tradition teaches that for the sake of 10 persons, Sodom and Gomorrah would have been saved. 
The saving of one life is tantamount to saving the entire world. So I'm going to say very briefly what the JFR does. We provide monthly financial support to aged and needy non-Jews. Right now, they're all Christian. Our last two Muslim rescuers died in January. They lived in Albania. We are supporting 130 men and women living in 13 countries. And we intend to send approximately between $900,000 and $1 million this year, 2022, to these noble men and women. And we offer an international Holocaust teacher education program, national and international. And it's so good to see so many learner fellows. And I know Professor Rosenthal and Professor Hayes and Irvin uh, and Steve Marcus can talk to you about the opportunities that as Stockton being a wonderful center of excellence, um, we work in partnership can provide. So when I was first asked by Professor Rosenthal to do uh, a presentation on Ukraine, she said, Stanley, talk about your work on Ukraine today. And then I saw, oh my gosh, it was supposed to be 45 minutes in length. So let me spend some time on what we're doing today. We all know Russia invaded Ukraine on February 24th, 1922. I introduced you to Vladimir Chernobyl at the beginning of this presentation. In 2014, the Soviet Union invaded Crimea. We were supporting men and women in Crimea, which was part of Ukraine. Crimea was bank sanctioned. We were unable to send money into Crimea. And I will say this as an aside, there is an organization called the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee which provides funding and support for Jewish Holocaust survivors worldwide. And they had survivors in Crimea as well. And for the, our organization, the JDC, the Claims Conference, we, it was near impossible to get funds into Crimea for our respective beneficiaries. At JDC and Claims Conference worked out their issues. We wound up working out our issues by having adult children of the rescuer leave Crimea and go into the Russian Federation, which was not bank sanctioned, to pick up the funds that we send. We send our money by Western Union. I am a Western Union quick cash agent. So for all rescuers living in countries except Poland and the United States, they get their money through Western Union. And Western Union, we are, you know, cannot operate in Crimea. Realizing that we believed what U.S. intelligence had said, Russia is going to invade, I sent our money early. Our money was not supposed to go until March 26th. We send money three times a year for four months at a time. The rescuers know this, we've been doing this. I've been at the JFR, it'll be 30 years this September. I sent money on February 6th to both Ukraine and to the Russian Federation. And we called, we emailed, and this is from Vladimir Chernobyl, who I said in 1998 had a full head of white hair. This is Vladimir. He turned 100 on September 1, 2021, and he will be 101 this September. And we email back and forth. I do Google Translate. He does Google Translate from English to, uh, we do Russian. He lives in a part of Ukraine you don't want to live in. And they are unable to evacuate because he is unable to evacuate. This is what he wrote us on February 9th. Good afternoon, dear Stanley Stoll. Yesterday I received an, another, the award from you, thanks a lot. Yes, the current situation in Ukraine is very depressing. I watch everything on TV. Morally, it is very hard. At the same time, one constantly remembers the war that I survived, and now Russia is rushing, wants to swallow us. This, of course, does not add health, just the opposite. Various medicines support me. 
On the same day, we bought everything we needed, both in the pharmacy and in the stores. Thank you again. Happiness to you and health. Sincerely yours, Vladimir. And this is Vladimir with his son. They look alike. And this is his family. And so I get, I get photos. We write back and forth. We offered to evacuate anyone who wanted to evacuate Ukraine. We offered to provide funding. And more on that as we go through this presentation. On February 24th, the day of the invasion, this is Oksana and Tipchik with her great, great grandchild. And this is what they wrote. Our dear friends, we are forced to turn to you for help in connection with the current situation in our country. We are at war. People are leaving their homes looking for shelter. They are left without food and water. Shops are closed. Everyone is leaving for safe places indefinitely. If there is any way to help our family financially, we will be very grateful to you. Forgive us. With best wishes, Oksana, Markovna, and Tipchik's family, peace to all of us and take care of yourself. When I received this email, I went to our board, a group of very dedicated men and women, and we agreed to send everybody an emergency award of $2,000, bringing to $3,000 the total amount that rescuers in Ukraine would receive uh, in February and into the first week in March. We get proof of life from the rescuers. I, sitting in West Orange, New Jersey, have no idea if Oksana is still alive. We get proof of life. Right now, because of the war, we're asking for photos with a date and a timestamp. Or they hold the daily paper if their daily paper is still publishing. And I have a wonderful volunteer who is from Kyiv. And we called each rescuer. Some of the rescuers could not pick up funds immediately. The banks didn't have the money. She lives in Kyiv. And they were able to pick up, they were only able to pick up the funds after her grandson came back from his military service. Because remember, Russia was targeting Kiev in the beginning. And when he went to the bank, he was able, because he's authorized to pick up funds for Oksana. Let me introduce you to Alexander Slobodniak. This came on February 28th. They lived in Kherson which I'm sure you all know about, and you know it is in Eastern Ukraine. You don't want to be in Kherson. And it says, hello, we are family. We, our family, are now in Western Ukraine in the ivano frankivsk region. And that's, that's all the way west. I've been to ivano frankivsk There is a major university there, and they're in a small village. We escaped the bombings. We fled in what we were wearing. We left everything at home, took only documents, cards, and a computer. We are now safe a thousand kilometers from Kherson. Now me, dad, that's Alexander, my husband, my husband's mom, and our 18-year-old grandson are here. We were taken in by my husband's sister. They are very kind and warm-hearted people. We are very grateful to them. How long we will live here, we don't know. We don't know whether our house will remain intact in the Kherson region under occupation. We will not return until our territory is no longer occupied. Best regards, Ledmila. Stanley, I'm sorry to cut you. I'm not okay. cutting you short. I'm just saying that I think we have a few questions. Okay. We have to end at 10 a.m. Okay, so, so let me just go through. I thanks. have a very few left. Thank you. This, this is, uh, thank you. This is, uh, uh, Valentina Galinka. This is Lydia Savchuk. We helped her evacuate to Switzerland. She's 97. She left with her daughter, Elena, and we sent the money where her grandson lives in Lucerne, and we sent her money via Western Union in Swift, thank, uh, in Swift Franks. Thank you for your support in these hard times. Olympia Daniela, will be 100 on December 2nd. She also lives where you don't want to live. They cannot evacuate. They're near Odessa. They cannot evacuate because she's too old. And you can see how the rescuers got dressed for the photos. This is uh, Ivan Ugrenyuk. And this is the last one is Mamchenko. We lost him. We hadn't heard from him until, until 20, um, 
2017 was the last time. He is still living again in Eastern Ukraine. A neighbor is now taking care of him and we immediately sent him the $3,000. And so that is my presentation and I'm here for questions. Thank you, Stanley. Um, we have a few questions. Um, the first question, generally do uh, the rescuers share their stories to others or are they concerned about anti-Semitism today? It's an excellent question. Thank you for asking. It depends on where they live. Uh, many rescuers, when they were in their teens and early 20s, were very, were very brave. Now that they're in their 90s and some in their hundreds, they don't want their neighbors to know that one, that they're getting money from America, that it's coming from a Jewish organization, and three, that they help save Jews. If you go to Western Ukraine, and this is not a lecture on um, Jewish um, relation, Jewish thoughts and feelings and beliefs as it relates to Ukraine, because Ukraine, some people in Ukraine did collaborate. If you ever listen to Professor Jeffrey Bird's lecture on collaboration. Um, so the answer is, it's not like in America where many of the educators such as those here today will invite a survivor into their classroom. Some will speak, most do not, either because they're not speakers, they're not asked, they're afraid to. So it's a myth, it's a mixed bag. Okay, and um, the follow-up question to one of your uh, later points is, um, do you have representatives in Ukraine helping today? I know you, you talked about a volunteer, but is it just one? My volunteer is in Manhattan, but we will work with other Jewish organizations that are on the ground. So you had Israel Aid was in Moldova. You have, um, there is a major JCM. You know, there is this wonderful Jewish community center in Odessa. And, you know, if people were able to get to Odessa, but now Odessa is being bombed. And so we would work with the claims conference, the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee. And I will also work with private individuals that I know from my various visits to parts of Ukraine, um, et cetera. We do not have any representatives on ground. Our staff is very small and we're based in West Orange, but we use men and women that we know and that we trust and that I can send funds to safely where there's accountability and they could help get money to the rescuers. I can get money to the rescuers, except in far Eastern Ukraine. I can't get money to anybody in her son right now. And that way that rescuer has now gone to the other, other part of the country. Okay, thank you. And uh, someone went on the JFR website while you were presenting and they wanted to know how they could introduce um, the Jewish Foundation for the Righteous to their students. And what other resources do you have for classroom use? Okay, I put in the chat, my email, I introduced Dr. Andrew Buchanan, who is our new senior uh, program associate for education. He's a former learner fellow, taught in Randolph High School for 20 years. I know Irvin knows him very well <laughs> because of this summer. And we're here to provide assistance. We can help you with classroom activities. We used to have a poster set on rescue. Uh, all, all copies are gone. I'm not sure we're gonna republish. We have documentaries that are on the website. They are, they're available for free. They're, they're between 11 and 15 minutes in length. They're ideal for a classroom period. So what my PowerPoint didn't talk about is that yes, if you're not teaching to rescue, do include it. It's a part of the historiography of the Holocaust. While it's a small part, it's a part. And so I urge you, and we are here to provide assistance to help you with a lesson plan if you wanna add and to tell you where it will match the New Jersey, for those of you in New Jersey, the New Jersey state standards. Okay, and someone followed up that question with, what are the documentaries about on your website? The documentaries are about every year, we're a nonprofit, we raise money. 
So every year we would do a dinner, mainly at the Waldorf Astoria before it was sold to the Chinese and closed and at the New York Public Library. And then COVID came. So we have not had an event since 2019. But every year we would re reunite a righteous Gentile with a Jewish person he or she had saved and they hadn't seen each other since the end of the war. And we would go to where the rescuer lived, which was usually where they did their saving, their rescue, or if in many cases, there were people from Poland who lived in what is now the former Soviet Union. And at the end of the war, they went, they went to Poland because they did not feel comfortable staying in the Soviet Union. And we would bring the rescuer back to where the rescuer took place. We would interview the survivor who was more often than not in America. Uh, one was, we had several in Israel. We had one in, in Rio de Janeiro. And then we would film the reunion at Kennedy Airport. And so you would hear from both the rescuer and the survivor in their own words, the rescue story. So it gives you a glimpse to rescue in Ukraine or Lithuania or Poland or Belarus or Greece or Roddy Edmonds, there are, one, there are two documentaries. One is available, the other you require a password for, you need to con con contact me. And he was an American GI who saved 200 American Jewish GIs who were captured in the Battle of the Bulge. Thank you, Stanley. And I did uh, repost your uh, email and phone number as well as Dr. Uh, Buchanan's information and the JFR website in the chat for everyone to see. And we will also uh, resend that information out um, after the sessions today. So thank you, Stanley. And I'm going to turn it over now to Professor Gail Rosenthal. Hi, and Stanley, thank you so much. And I make sure that when I teach about the Holocaust, I always end with From Despair Comes Hope. And I use the films, uh, which are only generally 15 minutes long, about the reunions. And a quick story is that I had a student last semester um, researching a family that lived in Atlantic City area, which uh, Dr. Hayes is going to talk a few minutes about that project, but they were researching Cherinsky, C-H-A-R-I-N-S-K-Y. They stumbled on the film of the reunion. We had no idea that this Holocaust survivor uh, survived because they had been hidden, Sally Cherinsky. So um, you may even find that there's a survivor from your area, um, you know, some part of the United States, wherever you're from, or, you know, the, another part of the world. And Stanley, thank you so much uh, for joining us today. And you're our segue into a Dr. Michael Hayes, who is our resident historian today. And um, I know that Dr. Hayes several times taught at Jewish Foundation for the Righteous when you were doing your seminars at Columbia University. So um, Dr. Hayes, we're gonna give you a few minutes. I know um, that we wanted you to talk about why is this called the Wally and Lutz Hammerschlag Summer Educator Seminar? And we wanted to know, you know, what have you been doing this summer? What's up? What's happening at Stockton? And um, you're on. All right, thank you, Gail. And thank you, Stanley, for a really excellent presentation. I always love uh, to hear about the individual stories. Um, yeah, Gail's asked me to say a little bit about the Hammerschlag family. Uh, Volly and Lutz Hammerschlag are, uh, in a way, the sort of patri matriarch and patriarch of the family uh, which went into exile. They were German Jews uh, who were able uh, to get out with their families. Uh, they were young at the time. Uh, just before the war started, after Kristallnacht, uh, they did, the families had no connection to one another. Uh, Vali Hammerschlag came from a small village called Lauenau in northern Germany. Um, Vali Hammerschlag, sorry, came from Frankfurt, a big city, uh, and the father of uh, Lutz Hammerschlag came from uh, a small village called Lauenau in uh, uh, Lower Saxony in northern Germany. Um, 
And when they got out, they, as many Jews, uh, German Jews uh, did, you know, at the last minute, they went to the only place they could find refuge. And it happened to be in Southern Rhodesia in Southern Africa, uh, today Zimbabwe. Uh, and it wasn't until after the war that the children of those two families met uh, in the town that they had both found refuge in, Bulawayo, the second largest city in Zimbabwe. Uh, they had four children in Rhodesia. Um, and I'm happy to you know, call uh, them friends. Uh, just last month, in fact, I was in Germany and in Poland with two of the children, uh, Leonard Hammerschlag and Mark Hammerschlag. Uh, we also uh, visited um, Poland because the brothers wanted to see Auschwitz. They think this might be the last opportunity, have, was the last opportunity they would have. Uh, it was actually all very moving. Um, after both uh, families uh, escaped, um, they spent a long time reestablishing their existence. You know, it's a typical sort of story of uh, not just survival and resilience, uh, but also sort of the trauma of a sort of dia Jewish diaspora within the diaspora. Um, uh, I had the privilege of working with Leonard Hammerschlag, who spends half of the year in Atlantic City in our area near Stockton and half of the year uh, in Cape Town, South Africa uh, to create a memorial uh, exhibition uh, to the families uh, in Ventnor, New Jersey, which is adjacent to Atlantic City. Um, and as part of that, uh, or growing out of that project uh, in 2018, we went to Germany uh, and visited the sites related to their parents. Uh, we installed memorial stones called stumbling stones or Stolperstein in German uh, for the family in Frankfurt. And this past uh, month, uh, we went back to do the same thing for the family in Lauenau. Um, uh, I could say so much more, uh, but I don't want to take up too much time. Uh, one of the notable things for our purposes here at this workshop, I think, is that Vali Hammerschlag uh, uh, wrote uh, after they had left Rhodesia uh, for Israel uh, in the 1960s, um, uh, a short essay about her experiences on Kristallnacht as a young girl uh, watching her father get arrested, uh, watching the school and the synagogue the school where she went in the synagogue where uh, her family worshiped in Frankfurt um, uh, in flames. Um, uh, it's a really good piece, it's very short. And I think that Gail, you said, I think that you might make that essay available to the participants of the workshop. Yes, we're going to um, put the uh, link to it in the chat. And we're also going to, when we send Betty's book and Bob Holden's book, we're also gonna send a copy of the um, Kristallnacht uh, piece that Wally Hammerschlag uh, wrote, that what she remembers what happened that evening. And I know for myself, when I was a um, public school teacher, this is the time of year I'm already figuring out what am I gonna do in the fall? Um, it's something that you could include uh, at the time of Kristallnacht, which is November 9th to 10th. 1938. Uh, thank you, Gail. And, and, the, and the last little sort of um, story that I will tell that for me, and I think for the family, uh, and for many Germans who were present, uh, was extremely moving was in 2018, when we went back to the small village of Lauenau, which did not experience extreme violence um, on Kristallnacht. Um, the brothers Hammerschlag, Mark and Leonard, uh, brought with them um, a synagogue that their father's father, their grandfather in Lallanau, uh, who had been president of the synagogue community, uh, their family was the first family in, to settle, first Jewish family to settle in um, Lallanau. They had a, a Torah scroll that was 250 years old or more, we're not sure exactly how old, um, that the their grandfather had taken with them into exile. The few things that they took included some religious art, you know, objects, including the one of two Torah scrolls that was in the Lauenau synagogue. Um, and it went with him to Rhodesia. He took it with him to uh, South Africa, to, to Israel. 
uh, and when he passed away, he passed it on um, uh, to his son uh, in um, Atlantic City at, the, at that time, now deceased, Robert. Um, and so we took it back for the first time since World War II uh, to the village of Lauenau. And we were actually in the room that was the prayer room that was essentially the synagogue of this small village. Uh, it a, I, I can't tell you, it was, uh, uh, it was extremely moving. Uh, and everybody, uh, I think, uh, had tears in their eyes in many ways uh, at the significance of that. You know, so that's just a little bit about the Hammerschlags. Um, uh, and and so I'm, I'm very happy to talk much more about them, but I think I will leave it at that for now. And for everyone, I did place the um, the piece, the, the Wally uh, Hammerschlag piece in the Zoom chat box for everyone to view. And Dr. Hayes, the last question that we'd like to pose to you is, what's happening at Stockton in Holocaust and Genocide Studies? I know um, you teach in the undergraduate program, the graduate program, just if you could briefly just fill us in, because we have folks here on our Zoom that are not familiar with our Holocaust and Genocide Studies program. And then if you would introduce- Absolutely. As well, as, well as, as well as those who've gone through our programs at, at Stockton and Holocaust Genocide studies. I'm looking at you, Doug Servi, and Leah De Dukes, among many others. Um, yeah, what's not going on in Holocaust and Genocide Studies at Stockton? Uh, really, Holocaust and Genocide Studies is at the core of Stockton's activities, its mission. Uh, it's one of the things that the university is most known for. Um, in addition to the extremely active and successful and Sam Show for Holocaust Resource Center that Gail directs. Uh, uh, along with uh, Irvin, um, Mariano Rodriguez, who's here with us. Uh, we have an undergraduate minor. We have for many years. Uh, every semester, we teach more than 20 courses in Holocaust and Genocide Studies. Uh, this reaches more than 1,000 students every single year, every single academic year. In addition, we have a Master of Arts in Holocaust and Genocide Studies, the first standalone program of its kind in the world. Uh, that we founded in 1998, and I'm, I know I'm old because I was there <laughs> um, uh, when we did that. Um, uh, in addition to our in-person classes, more recent, we made uh, a decision to offer an entire program that is it's possible to take that entire master's degree online. Um, although it does, you know, it doesn't take away from our in-person um, uh, graduate degree program. Um, we have a dual credit program uh, that uh, my colleague uh, Steve Marcus will say more about in just a moment. Um, and what's going on right now that Gail was referring to is our South Jersey Holocaust Survivors Project that aims to create, uh, to, uh, to document the lives of all of the Holocaust survivors who lived in three counties in Southern New Jersey um, uh, and to present multiple exhibitions and we're in the process of create. We're well into the process of creating a digital archive uh, that will go live uh, to the public in September of this year. Um, uh, that's keeping me very busy because I'm curating that project with the help of many students. Uh, uh, at least one of whom I hope I'm not missing. Two of whom uh, I hope I'm not missing anybody. That's Irvin, um, uh, Marina Rodriguez, and Leah Dukes. I see is on here as well. Uh, have actually worked on that project. Uh, it's keeping us very, very busy, to say the least. Uh, we've identified almost 1,500 individual survivors, and we're documenting their stories in multiple ways. Um, it's really exciting. Uh, we'll have a small physical presence in the Holocaust Resource Center uh, and some online um, presentation of the stories of our survivors. Um, uh, it's really, uh, it's, it's going to be a, a fascinating and long-term project, ongoing project. Um, so. Without taking up any more of your time, I think I should turn uh, the program over uh, to my good friend and colleague, Steve Marcus, uh, who has been doing an amazing job as the founding uh, director of our dual credit program, uh, which has grown in leaps and bounds uh, since he took it on. Uh, so Steve. Thank you. Thank you, um, Michael. And I just want to add uh, Matt who's Assad, who's with us, um, has worked on the project. Thank you, Thank Matt, you. who uh, works in the Holocaust Center uh, with Urban. 
And I want to just, I love when I can correct Dr. Michael Hayes, which is, you know, my historian, to say it's dual high school credit so that it's, um, many of you that are on today are high school teachers. So this is a program designed for high school teachers. And those of you that are middle school teachers, this program could be a feeder from your school into your local high school. Steve, you're on. Well, thank you all very much for taking your time. And thank you, Stanley, for a rousing and inspirational presentation. Um, it's always good to start off on, uh, on a good light. And, you know, I, I think we as educators, uh, Gail spoke about this. This is something that um, is uplifting. And this is something that is relevant and enlightening. And uh, I'm so happy that so many of our learner fellows are here today. And so many of the learner fellows uh, are also dual credit uh, teachers. Um, so, you know, I'd like to welcome everybody. And, and, and I, I do want to give um, some praise to Michael Hayes, because although he called me the founding director, uh, because I am the... Um, the, co the current coordinator, actually, Michael Hayes, uh, was involved in a dual credit program uh, even before my advent. So, you know, we started off with two schools, Violent High School and Holy Spirit High School. And over the last eight years or so, uh, it's been quite a team effort. Um, we are about to uh, add our 35th school. Um, and while they are primarily in Southern New Jersey, uh, we have um, a, a, a few, we have one in Sussex County, we're adding one, Lisa's here uh, in Bergen County. And we also have a, um, a school in uh, Pennsylvania and, uh, what, how this works, and you know, some of you are aware, some of you aren't, is uh, there are high schools who either already offer a dual uh, or a, a Holocaust and genocide course, or who want to offer a Holocaust and genocide course. Um, if they the curriculum is already there, we we look at it, we fine tune it. If not, uh, we help you build it. Uh, so, you know, there are um, 35 existing uh, now, and, and we also have a couple on the horizon. And how this works is um, we give the students an opportunity to, uh, while they're taking the high school course, uh, to get four university credits from, from Stockton, which are transferable almost anywhere. Um, at either the cost of $400, which is $100 a credit, which is the same it's been for the last 10 years, or um, by grace of the laws of the state of New Jersey, if someone is on uh, free and reduced lunch, then they get a tuition abatement. Um, and, and, and so, you know, we've, we probably expose uh, a thousand students a year to this, not that a thousand of them uh, take it. We, we generally run between three and four, three and four, three and 500 um, students a year. And obviously this is an attraction to Stockton University uh, because, you know, they've already had experience. I also want to say that, you know, uh, Irvin will put my email in, in the chat. I'd be more than happy to speak with you about any of uh, these concerns. And I also want to stress the notion of a team effort. And uh, it, it's a great team. You know, the Saren Sam Show for Holocaust Resource Center, the uh, Holocaust and Genocide Minor, the dual credit program, the master's degree, um, the Jewish Foundation for the Righteous. So, you know, for teachers, the opportunities for uh, professional development are, are, are pretty amazing. We pass everything, uh, everything along to our teachers, and uh, we're very happy um, 
we're very happy with, with with the success of the program. So if you have any if you have any uh, questions, Stephen Marcus at Stockton Edu, and most of you have my uh, cell phone number anyway. So I think at this point I am um, I have the honor and pleasure to introduce um, someone uh, someone that almost everybody knows, but uh, with whom some may be unfamiliar. And uh, this person is Doug Servey. And I just want to tell you that I first met Doug Servey in 1978 uh, when he was my cooperating teacher for my junior practicum. And uh, we have known each other for some 44 years. Uh, it is a, a, a friendship. It is a working relationship. He taught at Oak Crest High School um, for about 85 years now, uh, 40 years. Uh, and he is um, an adjunct at Stockton University. And very recently, my good friend, uh, has been named the executive director of the New Jersey Commission on Holocaust and Genocide uh, Education. So I'm going to introduce you to a man who needs no introduction, Doug Servey. Uh, thank you, Professor Marcus. You are a piece of work, my man. I'll tell you that for sure. Um, thank you very much for, uh, for having me today to introduce Bob Holden and his program, uh, thank you to the Hammerschlag family for having this program and going through Stockton. Uh, as Steve had mentioned, I'm also a graduate of the master's program um, and a learned fellow through Stanley's program, which I highly uh, recommend that you get involved in that program. It's probably one of the best programs that's offered anywhere in the United States. Um, the film of Roddy uh, Edmonds is, is very worthwhile. I use that every semester. Uh, there's not a dry eye in the room because they also talk to the other POWs that were Jewish, which is amazing in and of itself. And it's a very poignant video that the students, uh, they evaluated as one of the best ones that I use every semester. Uh, thank you to Gail to have us here today, um, uh, you know, representing the commission. Um, if Irving can put in uh, my email address and Brandon's email address, we have a program in August for the teachers here. You can add on that, that you have nothing else to do. Um, having been in the classroom when I taught in high school for 41 years, uh, August 1st was like, oh, my God, school is going to start. And then the school stuff starts being sold in, in the various stores. And, you know, it's all downhill from there. But in any event, um, Bob Holden and I were asked by uh, Dr. Paul Winkler, who was a former executive director and just a wonderful man. Uh, my mentor and a lot of the people that are here mentors uh, of going to China and writing a, a curriculum on the Nanking massacre. Uh, we went with the Canadians which is New Jersey Alpha and then BC Alpha. And Bob will go into more detail about that as he goes into his presentation um, about you know, the, the Chinese involvement as far as what happened as far as the invasion when the Japanese invaded China and the atrocities that were committed by them. Um, I came home to my wife after going to the teacher's convention and said, um, I think I might be going to China with Bob. She goes, what for? I says, I'm not really sure yet, but we're probably going to go. So we ended up going for 16 days. Uh, which is an amazing trip in and of itself. We're the first two Americans to do that. The curriculum's online, um, you know, from the commission, if you want to look at that. If you need any information, both of us would be more than happy to provide that for you. Anything you need from the commission, feel free to combine, you know, ask us for anything. If you need a class size set of Bob's book that you'd like to have in your classroom or a class size set of Betty's book, um, which you're going to hear in the next presentation, we're more than willing to give you 25 copies at your taxpayer's expense because we've got more money this year from the state, which is good. So if there's other books that you would like to use, uh, feel free to contact myself or Brianna, who is my executive assistant at any time. But getting back to what we need to do here is to give Bob Holden the opportunity to go over his research that he did for his book, um, which everybody is gonna get a copy with. So if you want a class size set of those for your students that you wanna use year end and year out, contact us and we'd be more than happy to provide you with a class size set. I've known Bob for years, uh, pretty much how long, you know, Marcus has known me over the years. Um, he was a tremendous educator at uh, the middle school over at Ocean City, uh, continues his work. One of the things which he'll try to answer is we went on this trip in 2006 and here we are in 2022 
uh, one of the things is how long it took, why did it take so long to get this book written? And if any of you have done any kind of publication, there's one trying to find the time if you're a teacher to write a book in and of itself. And then you have doing the research and you want to make sure everything's factually correct. There's a lot that are involved in that. So, Bob, you're on. Marcus is mute still. You have to un un unmute, unmute Thank yourself. You, Marcus. Sorry. On. Thank Marcus, you. It's you're a pleasure on. to be here. And um, it's wonderful to see so many familiar faces. Steve Marcus, I taught both of his daughters back in the intermediate school way back in the day. Um, I retired from Ocean City in 2006 and then went on to teach at uh, ACCC. I've known Gail for 40 years. Uh, when I first started a, a Holocaust course for my gifted and talented junior high school students at Ocean City, I first approached Gail for help and information and oh my gosh, visits to the center back in those days were just fantastic. Materials and just an overwhelming uh, amount of help uh, that helped me through uh, all of this. And I see Neil Brandt and uh, Betty Grabenchikov, who helped me enormously with the book. Uh, Michael Hayes, um, your course was just fantastic. Um, I can't say enough how much I gained from that course. And I also want to say, Stanley, what a fantastic opening. That was a great uh, program. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Um, everybody, if I've forgotten anybody, Barbara Daniel, a good friend of mine who I've helped over the years with uh, materials and whatnot. And sadly, she's retired, but I hear she's got a great replacement. So that's nice. Um, uh, what to say about this book? Um, Doug, as Doug said, we went to China in 2006 and everybody's lamenting this heat wave. Doug and I will tell you, you haven't experienced heat as you would have in China in August. We were there in what was called the five furnaces and Doug will validate my uh, comment that it was about a hundred degrees virtually every day. And when we went to Beijing, it, it was a hundred percent humidity. Um, I recall being in the um, museum there and trying to put new batteries into my camera and I took them out of my uh, fanny pack and literally the batteries squirted out of my hands. That's how sweaty we were. We were drenched. It was terrible. Um, anyway, but, but the information we were able to glean from the trip was just fantastic. When we went to Shanghai, Doug got the idea that um, we should go if we could and, and we just told our, uh, our leader Tekla Lit and her husband Joseph that we were going to sort of escape by taxi and go to the Shanghai ghetto and the uh, synagogue that was there. So we took a taxi and took our lives in our hands in a Shanghai taxi and um, got there and spent the rest of the afternoon on that property. And it was absolutely fantastic. Now I had known a little bit about that, but not enough um, to, to do anything earlier than this. And what happened was I had heard about um, Feng Shan Ho. And so I did a little research and I found his book. Um, I recommend it, My 40 Years as a Diplomat. And that will be on the, the sheet of information I send out. Plus you'll see that in the bibliography of my book. Um, and um, Dr. Ho there is so, uh, modest about his efforts in the book. When I first read it, I, uh, I'm, I'm flipping back and forth pages trying to find, you know, what did this man actually do? And, and he really doesn't give it much. Uh, he doesn't give himself much credit. He's so modest. And so then I contacted Thecla and a few other friends and tried to get additional information. And the best information I got was from the Vancouver Holocaust Center because they knew a lot about uh, Feng Shan Ho and um, Nina Richter, who was the director there uh, and probably still is, um, gave me uh, some contacts. And the person she said I had to talk to was a man by the name of Eric Saul. If anyone's familiar with Eric, Eric is a tremendous individual, one of the nicest people you'll ever wanna meet. I will give you all of his information um, if anyone emails me, I'll send you the sheet with all of his 
visas for life um, um, website information. He's just a wealth of information and one of the most generous scholars I've ever met. Um, when I needed photographs, I opened a Dropbox and Eric sent me 75 pictures because he's been friends with Man Lee and Monto um, uh, Ho. And I, I just can't say enough about Eric. So I decided since I had just finished um, a book about my township's history, that I, since it was the pandemic, that it was the perfect time to jump right in and start on this. So um, it took me quite a while and I worked with Rob Huberman at CompTQ Publications and I sent a few drafts out to friends to sort of knock on the door and say, what do you think about this idea? And I'll tell you what really prompted me to move more quickly on this during the pandemic. Many of you recall that during um, or on the uh, back end of the pandemic, uh, that we saw incidents of Asian people, particularly older folks, being attacked on the streets by teenagers. And particularly in California, there was one heart-wrenching story that put me over the edge to finish the book, was this woman in, I believe it was San Francisco, who was literally just beaten nearly to death by a, a couple of teens that jumped on her and there were, you know, there were these accusations about the Chinese because uh, someone in our government um, talked and said that, you know, the Chinese um, created this problem and, and, and labeled the, the, the COVID Kung flu. And uh, I thought, having taught middle school and junior high for so long, that it was very, very important for students to read a story about a good Chinese man who did a lot of great work. So I contacted Tecla Lit at BC Alpha and asked her what she thought of the idea and she was greatly in favor of it. And um, she agreed to uh, underwrite the first 200 copies, which I decided I was going to give away. I'm not interested in making any money on this book. I mainly just want to get the book into as many junior high school hands as I possibly can. So Doug, through the uh, commission, um, was very generous and said, if you get the books to me, we will mail them out to all. So I decided to um, include all middle and junior high schools in the six county South Jersey area. And I hope to expand that with the, the sale of additional books. I'm very grateful that Stockton um, purchased a, a book to give to all of you today. And um, so that's really the history of how I came to this book. Why did it take me 16 years? Well, it didn't really take me 16 years. I didn't start this. When Doug and I came back from China, we had made a deal, if you will, with BC Alpha that Doug and I would write two curriculum guides for secondary schools, which have, they're available online still, but uh, the commission at the time also published hard copies and these were mailed out to every school district and um, those are still available uh, to you online. Um, it was a, an extremely rewarding experience. It, it, as I say, as it said, is on the back of the book, it changed my life because um, when I was teaching and um, uh, the, um, the book by Iris Chang came out, I immediately called all my colleagues and said, you've got to get a hold of this book. This is absolutely, because we weren't taught any of this about the rape of Nanking. So um, it was life-changing. Um, and so after Doug and I came back and finished these curriculum guides, we were invited to the University of San Francisco and gave a program and met Iris's parents and um, were able to spread the word. We also gave a presentation at the teachers convention in what was that year, Doug, 2007 or eight? I remember it well because on the way to the convention, I was hit by a car. So oh was, my goodness. So this is not the hit by the car is a perfect segue, but this is a perfect segue since 100% of our participants today are teachers. Um, Doug had written to me uh, in the chat that he had prepared some teacher questions that he would like to ask you that we can learn more about the book. Okay. So Doug, 
thank you so much. And you're on, my friend. So, Bob, what do you, you know, most teachers will say there's so much information out there. There's a lot of resources and quality resources. Um, why would teachers want to have this book in their classrooms to have their students read? And what would you like them to get out of this? Now, you, you know, can either I'm, answer some of that now or if you want to do a little bit of your PowerPoint is background information. Well, I, I don't I I don't have I was told I don't have the time for a PowerPoint today. So um, what uh, what I really think is important is for teachers to be able to use this book. When I was teaching at the uh, college, I gave um, out students were able to select them um, an, from an assortment of memoirs that were published by CompTQ. Um, including Betty's book and others, and they had to read them and do a, a, a classroom report. And I think that would be uh, a one way to handle this. It, it's extremely difficult for teachers I know today, especially if they're not concentrating on the Holocaust as their subject. In college, in my college course, Holocaust and Genocide Studies, I was able to do that. So that wasn't uh, a problem. But for teachers who have that difficulty of time, this might be a way of approaching it. But I think it's critically important that um, students, especially teenagers whose value systems are just being formed, are able to read a book like this uh, because it profiles a, a noble um, Chinese uh, diplomat. And one of his famous quotes, and I'll read it to you, I thought it only natural to feel compassion and want to help. From the standpoint of humanity, that is the way it should be. And I think that's the essence of Feng Shan Ho. Uh, he was a man who saw a problem, saw his friends and uh, Jews in Vienna being um, taken out, and he wanted to do something about it. So he created this idea of the exit visa and uh, was able to get people to China or to Shanghai. Um, and he basically doesn't mention the numbers at all, but uh, people uh, pretty much think now that he probably saved thousands of Jews with his exit visas. So I hope that helps. And if anybody else has a question you would like, please feel free to put it in the chat and Irving will, you know, relay that information to us. Um, so Bob, what were, what were some of the difficulties you had in writing this book? I know you'd mentioned a few things already, but what were, what were some of the problems that you have? And I think it's probably worthwhile to mention your former student that did the illustrations um, that are in the book. And for those, this is the book that you will be getting uh, to give you an idea that'll be placed in the mail through Stockton, which is very nice of them to be able to do that. Bob, go. All right, the, the difficulty in the beginning was um, getting uh, information. And like I said, I contacted Thecla who then uh, connected me with um, this Nina Richter, who had quite a bit of information about him. Um, in fact, fantastic story. Um, I don't know how exactly the, the center in Vancouver came by it, but they have documents, including a couple of these exit visas, because someone who works at the, at the center likes to go to thrift stores. And they went to a thrift shop in Vancouver and bought a couple of suitcases, uh, cardboard sided suitcases with leather trim, et cetera, brought them back, opened them up. And apparently these suitcases were filled with documents and papers that belonged to two women, sisters, who had been uh, in Shanghai. And uh, it was just an incredible find. And those uh, documents are on display in their center now. They still have possession of them. Um, and I have in the book a, a copy. Uh, Eric Saul was able to send me a, a color copy of one of those um, uh, visas. I did not, there's no color in my book, but you can still see the visa quite well. Um, I wanted an illustrator for the book. At first, I did not intend to have any photographs. I wanted it to be a, a book that was illustrated by someone. And that first someone was my daughter, who is a fine arts or was a fine, art, fine arts major and quite the artist. However, she's got she's raising two daughters and homeschooling them. And she passed on the job. So I was really disappointed because I thought it would be wonderful to have Robert and Rebecca Holden as the uh, people on the book. But anyway. So um, I don't know exactly how we were able to hook up again, but 
this student of mine who I taught over 40 years ago, who lives in Ocean City. Oh, I know. Um, she had sent me a Christmas card with a, uh, an engraving done by her um, of Santa Claus flying through the sky. And of course, I went back to the return address found out that she had been living in New York and is now living in uh, back in Ocean City again, contacted her. We had coffee at Starbucks and I pitched it to her and I said, how would you like to do the illustrations for this? Oh my gosh, I'd love to. So uh, we worked together on it. I would send her photographs of people that I would like her to illustrate and gave her directions. And I think you'll find the pictures that are in there are quite fantastic. She's a gifted artist. She works for um, several companies, including Cricket Magazine, and does a lot of work. She has her own line of greeting cards. Absolutely fantastic. So I was really thrilled that I was able to connect again to a former student who, by the way, I still, you know, as educators, you always remember the ones that leave a, a great impression on you. And this is the way this girl was. Even back in, I taught her in fourth grade. It was the year that I stopped teaching fourth grade and started the Gift and Talented program at the intermediate school. And Joy was just that, a Joy. She was the kind of student that if you gave her a math paper, there were drawings in every available empty space of that worksheet or, or study sheet. It, I, I knew she was going places even then. And so now she's, uh, having done the illustrations for me, I'm super pleased and Doug held up the book the illustration of Feng Shan Ho on the front cover is her work. So I'm grateful for that. So since you have this finished now, what would you want students or the teachers when they're using your book? What do you want them to get out of this? I know it's pretty much even along the same line what Stanley had gone over, that people want to become re rescuers and they don't look at it as, as in a heroic event. They're just doing what they think is right. What do you want your students and the students of people that use this book um, to get out of it? Well, I, I think the message of Feng Shan Ho is that just what Stanley said, that this is not something, uh, and this rang true in um, uh, Dr. Carol Rittner's course uh, on, um, or her book, The Courage to Care, and the film that followed it, was that these people um, that were rescuers did not think of themselves as somebody special. And I don't think Feng Shan Ho did it either. Um, he was just a man who saw what needed to be done and did it. And I think that's important for teachers to pass along to their uh, junior high school students. Very important. So what were the difficulties, if you had any, in getting it published? You know, that process in case maybe there's another teacher here that has a subject area that they want to get involved in um, and they want to publish a book. How did you go about doing that? Well, I couldn't, I couldn't have had a better publisher than Rob Huberman. Rob jumped on this project right from the beginning. He was totally in on it, um, totally supportive. I sent him an early, early draft of the, of the work and he was so enthused. And um, he was tough on me um, because I'm not a writer by any profession and Rob was just tremendous. I can't praise him enough. Um, he guided me along the way, helped me uh, to edit my own work, which was uh, quite a challenge. Because when I did the Upper Township History book, uh, those of you who have seen Arcadia Publications know that uh, it's, it's pretty formulaic and they took care of everything. Well, this was on me. So it was, it was a challenge, and, but uh, definitely worthwhile. And I just felt, especially having once taught at the intermediate school and my students were exposed to the story of Shogihara in Lithuania, there had been really nothing else that I had seen of many other diplomats from other countries, especially China. And I felt the connection of you know, what was going on in the country against Asian people. And I had a, a woman call me who uh, was born in China and told me how happy she was that this was being done. So that was another motivation of mine. I don't know how she got word about it, but um, a draft had been passed around to people and she saw it and was extremely supportive and that gave me great encouragement. Now, if you could, I think it'd be worthwhile, at least so people could see pictures of the synagogue that we saw that day when we, we had you know, talked to Betty because Betty, you know, her story is next. But I think if it's a possibility that you could do that, 
And if you people would like, you know, if the teachers would like a copy of the PowerPoint that Bob has, he'd be more than happy to, to give that to you. So you could use that in their classroom to give some background information, because most of my students, both at the high school level and also at the collegiate level, I mentioned the Nanking massacre, or I mentioned that Jews went to Shanghai. They're looking at me like I'm on another planet. They have no idea whatsoever that those events had taken place. Um, and that's obviously one of the reasons that Gail wanted to have this program today with Betty here. And if you do get a chance, you can also look at the, I guess it was CBS possibly, because Betty went international on the news, which was just awesome uh, that they were able to meet each now, other. Now, wait a minute. Years. You're giving away my Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Bob, were you able to share your screen or no? Uh, I just want to go back to one more point about Eric Saul. Eric Saul is, uh, I, and you know, I, I was amazed that this man was not on my radar before this. Um, you know, he has done so much work. Um, he was instrumental in getting the Japanese uh, their um, uh, reparations uh, after the uh, internment camps uh, were um, uh you know, exposed and what these people uh, had to go through. And he worked with uh, the, the United States government. He's done so many great things, including, well, you'll see his, when you go online and visit his website, Visas for Life, um, but he's also uh, part of the ISRA. I think he founded that, the Institute for the Study of Rescue and Altruism during the Holocaust. Um, he is also working right now on a program to honor the United States uh, organizations and individuals who rescued Jews and other refugees during the Holocaust. He's working on that right now, and you'll be able to see that work when you go on his uh, website. It's quite an extensive list. He was sharing with me last week, because we talk frequently on the phone, that um, one of the latest things he found out was that there were 50 Italian diplomats who saved Jews during the Holocaust. And he was a little bothered by the fact that he wanted to um, have Yad Vashem take all of these names, but they told him that they would only take one. And Eric got upset and said, well, I can't pick one out of 50, so I won't give you any. So it's a shame, but there are Italian diplomats and diplomats, and he has a list of all of them from other countries who saved Jews in Europe during the war. And he's, he's totally committed to, um, helping people understand and know who rescued Jews during the Holocaust. So, so if, I, if you are, some of us have our cameras on and I'm looking at my friend Stanley Stahl, who's having as a, a minor, you know, like shake up because she really wants to comment oh, about I'm sorry. recognition of Yad Vashem for individuals versus recognition of Yad Vashem for diplomats who saved Jews during World War II. So Stanley, I'm breaking every rule because Doug is probably going to, you know, have his attorney contact my attorney. <laughs> no. I interrupted, don't, don't, no, don't hold your breath. That's not I happening. interrupted his presentation, but truly today, all of these seminars are informal. And I know you had put in the chat that, um, you wanted to make a comment. So please, Stanley, this is the appropriate time. The, Go for it. Well, my only comment is, we live in the, I'm assuming, well, Gail, Professor Rosenthal indicated- Yes, Gail, it's fine. From outside of America. Yad Vashem is Israel's Holocaust Authority. They set up their guidelines. Whether we like it or not, it's their guidelines and their review process. They have a dual review process for recognizing men and women as righteous. First level and the second level is headed by a justice of Israel's Supreme Court. That's how important they consider this review. There are, it is my understanding that there's a basic set of criteria for people, you know, Men and women that I showed you in my presentation and that are on our website and are on Yad Vashem's website who are not diplomats. It is my understanding from Dr. Mordecai Padiel, who is director of the Department of the Righteous at Yad Vashem for many years until he retired. He now lives in New Jersey for diplomats. 
So diplomats had a different, there was a different set of criteria that was used for diplomats. As far as um, Eric Saul, who is a, he did visas for life. He's done wonderful things. What you need to know is there are criteria for being recognized. There are some Americans who have now Hiram Bingham. So we can talk about, you know, maybe Eric did give Yad Vashem 50 names. I am surprised that Yad Vashem, Joel uh, Zuswine is the current director of the Department of the, of the Righteous that they would not accept it. It's not just a matter of giving names. You need to have testimony. And sometimes it is very hard to get. So I'll give one example. A man named Nekdek Kent was a Turkish diplomat in Southern France. His son was head of Coca-Cola at the time I was approached by someone from California who said, can't we get Nekta Kent, a Muslim rescuer from Turkey, recognized? He allegedly took 90 Jews off of deportation trains. We were for years, Dr. Padiel, himself a Belgian Jew, was saved by a Catholic priest in France. We, I worked, Dr. Padiel worked, we were unable to verify this claim. And Nekta Kent, who may have done this, he may not have done it, I do not know. We were unable to get him recognized. We all try our very best to get men and women recognized and sometimes based on the guidelines and that's what they go by, that's what I have to go by, we don't recognize at the JFR. So I just wanted to indicate there is a difference. It is my understanding between uh, how a diplomat is viewed and I think, you know, most diplomats only, to the best of my knowledge, only one diplomat was murdered during the war. It was a Polish diplomat. Most diplomats were not risking their lives. We understand what happened to Raul Wallenberg, but he wasn't killed by the Germans. So I just needed to explain there is a difference yeah. in criteria and how it's approached. That clarity is very important. Thank you. Thank you both. And Irvin, I wonder, were there any questions in the chat? Yes. Did you want me to ask them now? We have just 10 minutes left. Yeah, go ahead. Do it. Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead, Irvin. Um, there is an educator who asked about um, Japan's reaction to um, the consul's actions during World War II. Well, remember, Japan really didn't care about Jews. Um, even and Betty can back this up. When um, the Jews came to the Shanghai ghetto, the Japanese did not mistreat them, did not really persecute them. They were they hated the Chinese and they treated the Chinese terribly, even as they were taking in these people in their midst. Um, but and I think that's made very clear um, in uh, at least what uh, Feng Shan Ho wrote about and what I also included in my book. Is that, would you agree with that, Betty? Thank you. And the second question is, um, as a teacher, how do I introduce uh, Fang Shang Ho uh, to my students? What would be some of the first steps that I should take? Well, I think what you do when you introduce um, a, a rescuer, you include him in the array of people that you might want to introduce your students to. Um, you can talk about Le Chambon uh, Sumer and um, the, the rescuers in Southern France, however you would like to do it. Um, I found in my college course that my best introduction was to use Carol Rittner's film the Courage to Care as an introduction to um, uh, rescuers. So it, it, it's, it's up to each individual teacher, but it's important that it be done. I hope that helps. Thank you. Uh, Professor Servi, those are the questions that we have for now. Well, thank you. Thank, I would like to thank everyone for one, attending, two, for the Hammerschlag family for running this program again, Gail and, and Irving and everything everybody has done. 
Stanley, most definitely, if you are able to go to that program, do yourself a favor and you should probably go yesterday. Um, if you're able to do that, uh, for those that have not been involved in the master's program, and an excellent idea if you really want to get an in-depth study. I mean, Stockton has the premier program in the United States. Um, I don't know what your NGEA you know, situation is as far as, um, you know, with your school district as far as reimbursement goes, but whatever little money they may give you, it's a, it's a really, really good idea uh, that you take advantage of that. And like I said before, if you need anything from us at the commission, feel free to contact myself or Brianna, and we will get back to you within 24 hours at the very least. Steve, thank you for your nice comments. Dr. Hayes, for putting up with all of us. And um, I hope everybody enjoys the next session, which I know you will with Betty, because she's just an awesome person on the, on the highest level, believe me. Thank you very much. Bob? Thank, uh, thank you. Just one last remark. In the chat, I have placed my uh, email address. And just as Doug said, you get in touch with me, I'll be back to you within 24 hours. And anyone that contacts me, I will send them the information uh, sheet that I've created yesterday uh, to give you additional information beyond the book. And I thank Gail and the Holocaust uh, Resource Center for uh, mailing you a copy of the book. I, I, I'm very anxious to hear uh, what your reactions are. So again, contact me anytime it's convenient and I will get back to you very rapidly. And thank you. Bob, just a question that somebody wrote to me. Um, and we should have, you know, included it with our questions is, are you available either by Zoom or in person to meet with our students uh, once we've prepared them to learn more about um, your book and, you know, the focus of your study? Oh, absolutely. When the books were mailed out by Doug's office, uh, we included uh, a, a cover letter that encouraged schools that once they got a copy of the book and were able to pass it along to whomever they felt it was best to be used, uh, that I they could contact me and I would visit any school that asked me. I will bring, I have a, a very large PowerPoint about Feng Shan Ho with uh, a lot more pictures, of course, than I have in the book, and I would be happy to do that. And what grade level, what's the lowest grade level, you know, up through high school that you're comfortable um, meeting with those students? I think junior high through high school, because this book, even though it's written for middle school, really um, friends have told me that it's very readable for older kids and adults, even for that matter, especially if you don't know anything about this man and his work. So um, that's fine. No, I think lower I, I, than that is it's, it's not. Could you be specific the grade? Because in New Jersey, it really depends where you live. What is junior high? Right. And in fact, well, that word in my area, they don't use anymore. They call it middle school. Right. So what grade are you talking about? I think I'm talking six through 12. Okay. Uh, below that is not good. Uh, I have a granddaughter who's going into sixth grade and, and she is reading the book. So, um, but she's, you know, like everybody's granddaughter or grandchild, she's really special <laughs> and is a great reader. Uh, but anyway, um, she's enjoying it. So, I think it would be appropriate. Thank you.